Hello and welcome to our weekly share on the Parsha with the commentary of the Al Shakakonish. As usual, the share is a sponsorship, and the sponsorship is for three people, or rather for two people, and the memory of somebody who's passed away. And uh, that would be my wife's uncle, who's uh, during the, the month of the Shloshim, he just passed away. And so for Chaim Abiezer Ben Yaakov, this share should contribute for his Neshama to have an aliyah. But there are two little children who are not well at the moment. Uh, Mom, we've been dabbling for quite a while. He's waiting for a transplant. Uh, he's, this, he's the grandson of two of my very closest friends. And uh, his mum and dad are very special people as well. Um, and it's called Oria uh, Chaim Ben Hannah Yehudis. So he should have a the transplant he needs. It should be an incredible success. Um, the parents should uh, have no more worries as they watch the little boy grow up uh, in, in, in health uh, and happiness. And as a girl, baby girl, uh, and two, and uh, she needs, she's on, I think she's on the mend, but she needs a uh, art feels as well. And she's called Yudas Bas Chaya Malka. Um, she's in, in Jerusalem. And uh, so she needs a bit of refu as well. So all together, uh, hopefully the share will, and your participation in the share will contribute to affecting that very uh, desirable outcome for all three. Okay. Um, this week's Parsha is the Parsha, or the last Parsha, and the Yikro is Bechukhoisai. And of course, it starts off, by the way, with the famous word, in Bechukhoisai. Uh, so I have it here, <laughs> when I prepared before the show, as I say. Um, and Parsha Bechukhoisai starts with this tiny word, in. Um, and I was very, uh, very, I, I did some uh, serious uh, research before trying to find out exactly, sorry grab the wrong book. I have it up in front of me. Oh, that's embarrassing. Um, I'm trying to find if any in my Kabbalistic books or my Hasidic books talk about the word Eden. Um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting word. Of course, the famous Rudyard Kipling, the, uh, the, the British, I should probably say English, although he was born in India, uh, the poet of empire, when there was a British empire. Um, he famously uh, has a poem called If. Uh, if also just two two letters in the English uh, word as well. If you will go, and it's, of course the, the whole theme of that poem is to to take something which is you know small word if, but the 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 ramifications of if are enormous. Maybe a small word, but enormous. In of course in Hebrew, I'll remember. So I was looking for something Kabbalistic. Uh, I haven't found anything as yet. I promise to be to share it with you if I do. It'd be nice if there was a gematry and it links to something else, etc. cetera, and find some uh, nice Zohar to talk about this. I did notice that Hashem's um, retort to, uh, to if Im fails is Af. Um, Im is Aleph, one, and then Mem is 40. Af is one, and then Pe, which is 80, twice as much. So im seems to produce af, but it seems to be in double quantity. And the af is um, means anger, God's anger. Of course, God doesn't really get angry, but it uh, evokes a response in us as though he's got angry. We have consequences from our point of view are going to be the same. Uh, but it seems to be double the amount of af response that will be triggered by the im. If my completely made up theory, this has got no source of Judaism whatsoever. There's a pure rubbish demon there for you can discount the entire thing. But if there's any validity to it, it certainly, I think, does bespeak a very important truth. And that is very often it takes much more to shock a person out of their if um, than, uh, than just the same amount um, of response uh, back measure for measure. It seems a little bit more measure for measure, but that's what we're really going to be going, going on to talk about. So I think I will stop blithering and begin the sheer proper. And probably this is you've been with me over the last two years, remember, this is the second series of the option. I uh, will know that uh, um, very often I use a phrase in my share which goes as follows I can present evidence to open minds, I cannot present evidence to open minds. So I'll try that one again because, in case you've never heard before, or you're new joining me, it might sound totally uh, opaque and enigmatic uh, or even contradictory. I'll try again. Uh, I can present open yeah, I, can say, I can present evidence to open minds. I cannot present evidence to open minds. And what I'm trying to say is that it really depends on how you're using the word open, either as an adjective or as a verb. Um, if, and here's our if in there, if it's an open mind, I have all the evidence in the world. 
Um, however, if the mind is not open, then I can't help. So I can present evidence to open minds if it's an open mind, if it's describing the mind, adjective, open. I don't, I can't present evidence to open a uh, verb, to open the mind. If the mind is closed, then there's nothing I can do. And probably nothing you would, uh, you, you would think anybody could do. I remember many years ago, um, a rabbinical conference in London, Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs had uh, once a year, around about Elmo time, gathers all his rabbis from all the his shuls, the associated shuls of the United Synagogue, the largest synagogal, there's a funny word, synagogal, synagogal organization in the UK. And I was very honored and much surprised to be invited to speak to all the rabbis um, under his umbrella. Um, anyway, so I was, and in it, I told the following story. The story, uh, it was told to me by my very dear friend, Rabbi Professor Dr. David Gottlieb, who teaches our Sabbath in Yerushalayim, and in case you've never come across him, please go to his website, soon you finish listening to this. All his shares are free, and he is, uh, so I might come to think of it, um, and, uh, and he's a mind well, well worth getting to, to engage with. Oh, just also tell you in case you notice I'm wearing new glasses. I'm not wearing new glasses. I'm wearing old glasses because I can't find work with my new glasses. Oh, actually, it's not true. I just found them when I was looking for a safer beforehand, and they're on the shelf behind me. I'm beginning to see them. And uh, I put them top of my store. However, I'm just going to keep these on because I like them. Can I listen? I'm a bit of the mics. Anyway, uh, leaving that aside, he once told me uh, that the Boston Rebbe, his Rob, his Rebbe, who was a very, very wise and clever man, once said to him the following thing What right? Have you to go for, and use the Yiddish phrase, the schwerer nations, the difficult cases? What right have you to go for the difficult cases? And Rabbi Gottlieb uh, explained that, that to his mind, what it meant is one day he would be standing in front of the base team Shabbat, the heavenly court, and they'll say, What's your name? And they'll say, My name is David Gottlieb. Tell us a little about yourself, they will say. They'll say, Well, I was born into a reformed family. So my name used to be Dale Gottlieb. And um, when I was 19, I think it was the Harvard EM, one of those two, um, he was introduced to the Boston Rebbe, who uh, intrigued uh, and electrified him and uh, intellectually. And so he became his Rebbe eventually. Um, and then he taught philosophy at Johns Hopkins University, which he did. Uh, and during that time, um, he then goes on to, that's the true, so the story, but then he went on, of course, to Yerushalayim to teach in Arzmeh. But let's, let's vary history a little bit, uh, and he says, but imagine I stayed there my entire life. So he then turns around to the, to the heavenly court, and he says, and, and there were two other Jewish professors there. One was a communist, one was an atheist, and I struggled with them, I fought with them, I argued with them for uh, 40 years, and eventually I, I persuaded them that I was right, and I had these two other souls with me, and, with the two other souls standing slightly behind them, who I was succeeded in, in helping to become the room. And he says, but I always imagine at the other end, on the other side of the room, there is a maybe five, ten, in this case could be a hundred thousand other neshamas, other souls that turn around and shout at him, yeah, but what about all of us? And all the time and all the effort that you put into those two, you could have made all of us for what right have you to go for the Shvera and the Shabbos for the difficult cases, for the people who will who don't have open minds? Now, interestingly, in the story, and it's just a story, I mean, he imagines that he did eventually open the minds, but what would you lose in the exchange? But we still haven't solved the problem of how you could open a mind which is closed. Uh, my Chavrusa, one of my Chavrusas, um, a very dear and old friend, the, the, the son of my role, the gates of Rabbi Raka, the second side of the Rocha, Rabbi Mitzalo Raka, the son of Tony, lives in Brooklyn, uh, in New York, not too far from where I am, and I teach in Brooklyn uh, three times a week. And we have the great uh, uh, pleasure, I think I can say that jointly, of learning with each other. And uh, he pointed something out to me uh, just yesterday when we were learning. And, uh, it, by coincidence, very much interfaces with what the Halsh is going to go on to talk about when uh, we move on from here, as we shall do, to discuss this if question, uh, because the Parsha, of course, uh, posits what's going to happen if the Jewish people keep the laws of the Torah, and what we're going to focus on, focus on this year, and what happens if we don't, 
um, for two ifs. Okay, and bear in mind my little story about I can present evidence to open minds. I cannot present evidence to open minds. However, here is a prayer. Uh, this is before people of various uh, customs, uh, which bits, extra bits of dabbling around to chakras. And uh, just before, it, it, many people have been accustomed to say, okay, the, skulk, the, the story of the binding of Isaac. There is a little medica meditation before then. But before we get to the meditation and that bit, there's the, the following prayer. And I always when I think too many glasses off because I have to be looking at text here. Um, anyway, I always say this every morning. And whenever in the course of the day something goes wrong, and you, you meet somebody who's an extremely unpleasant person. And if you drive if you drive in, in the streets of New York, and that's almost an inevitability, uh, especially if they're behind the wheel. Uh, but anyway, you hear some of the Nicholas Shem the Kai Billy let it be your will, God of my fathers, my God, should 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 save me today and every day and me as upon him from people who are as upon him, chutzpahdik, or me as upon him, and from chutzpah itself, me odemra from a bad person, me chavura from a bad friend, or a bad neighbor perhaps, me shokanra, no, no, shokanra was got his own, sorry, uh, that's the bad neighbor, me um, pegara situation which is bad, me sota mashkis from the destroying angel. Me dean kosher from a difficult dean judgment. Me bal dean kosher from a bal dean, somebody either in charge, could you mean the person in charge of the deal, the, the, the dean, the judgment, or the person you are in conflict with in court. Bain should then brace, bain should enemy brace. Whether he's somebody of the covenant or somebody not within the covenant, which I always took to mean up until yesterday. It's talking about so if your opponent in court in some sort of case is a Jewish person or it's a non-Jewish person, right? If they're if they're tough nuts, Jewish or not Jewish, you, you really don't want to bump into such people, particularly in the courtroom setting. That's what I understood it to be. But the commentary on the building on Cedar, which I have here, uh, it is a commentary here called Sir Yitzchok. Um, the uh, Sir Yitzchok was uh, written by Rabitzo Blozer. And Rizzo Blozer was one of the great Talmudian of the Strauss of and, uh, and therefore, by definition and by extension of only a generation or so of the film, the gone. And so he says and gives an explanation or an insight, which, which is a, fits perfectly into the theme we've been discussing till now about the person who will listen and the person who won't listen. So maybe I'll read this to you. So he says the following thing You should keep away from the Dean Kosha from a, a difficult. Uh, Matter of judgment, whether being judged, make, I suppose making judgments yourself. Shmuel Yisdano Shailas Koshes, the Isposer Kashehim Nigmorim Nigmorim Bagrifyon. But you should be able to avoid Din Kosher questions which are very difficult to answer, and you don't find a happy or a satisfying solution. But Lev Noikev Imhu Isa Kashura, and it upsets you because you can't get the right answer. So you imagine slave, mazekas, and lukas and efesh, and maybe it will be this show to the top one. Because if you do have a, a problem and you solve the problem question, uh, and you solve the problem, then that's, that's quite satisfying. If you don't, then it's not satisfying. Okay, that would be the first thing. What's the bow dean kosher? So that's the dean kosher, difficult uh, case. Bow dean kosher. Autumn she'ina metasha bedato be called peace a bound in is somebody who would just not accept an answer, no matter how appropriate, correct, and right the answer is. Somebody who just isn't listening. I can present evidence to open minds. I cannot present evidence to open minds. And with Pak Vic Talmud, I'll call the I'll call the Sikhus of Benuya or a Yerushim Hatzedik, who mark us about seeking with Lee Oil. So even though you're going to make every single correct answer under the sun, he's just it, in nitpicking. He just wants to. He's just not going to be satisfied. So it's exactly as I was saying before. I can present in so open says, nothing you do to somebody whose mind isn't open. This guy's just not listening. So that's a, a balding kosher. Okay. But then he goes on to say the following thing. And then it says, whether he should Ben Brees, whether he's a Ben Brees, now that would normally be some, someone of the covenant that would normally apply a Jewish person. When it says somebody is part of the Jewish people, in other words, then it would be talking about somebody who comes to you with a challenge on something which is part of the Torah, of which there is a question. There is indeed, he's got a legitimate question. 
that we're talking to somebody who's not going to be satisfied. Uh, but it's good difficult. But he's just not satisfied. He's, he just will not give up and, and give in, even though he should throw in the towel because his argument, his, his question has been gainsaid. He's been, he's, he's been supplied with a, a, truly a satisfactory answer, but he's just not, he's just not accepting it. Okay, yes, but that never in the possible chaos and new sciences, almost exceeding the gear. You know, the, the, the struggle of foolish people uh, is tiring, tires them out, certainly tires you out listening to them. They're just not listening to the truth. But let's get to the other thing, which is the last bit. And she'enu memory. So you're, you're struggling with somebody who's a, a tough character and is not, I thought, a Jewish person. But it doesn't mean that. He says, the Yoba Batinus al Torasina had to be. The, the, the person who should enemy he comes with complaints or he comes with uh, criticisms uh, or objections to aspects of our Torah. Because if this person had a reasonable uh, approach, reasonable logical approach, uh, then indeed to know that if and Vera means then he would he would let go. But this guy's like a root buyer, he just won't let go. This is also gun king yimsa by Nachas. Um, and if only he did that, then it would be much better for everybody. But if this person is somebody who doesn't use the logical approach to analyze the Torah that the Chum have given, you'd give him meters. Uh, for him that we learn again also we say every morning in Shabbos. He doesn't uh, apply. The, the normal uh, analysis, uh, correct analysis to, to the study of the Torah. Um, rather, in here, he's abandoned that. But he's looking for the truth without using the techniques which the rabbis, the Chachamim, are given in order to reach the conclusion, the logical conclusion. But Rosa Lahargish Bechush, but Malkum Shatzar has the sequel. Big stuff. This is the one that Michael, the bit Michael Brisk got very excited about. But he wants to feel, he wants to feel it's right. It, it just doesn't sit in his kishkas, as opposed to it doesn't sit in his seiko. It should fit in your seiko. Even if you don't feel it's right, is it right? Does your brain tell you it's right? Then who baldin kosher but then that's a baldin kosher. If somebody is telling you, you can show me and present me all the information in the world. I'm simply refusing to uh, accept it, uh, then really you've wasted your time. And those 10, 20, 40, 50,000 Nishamas in the Rabbi Gottlieb's imagined exchange in heaven. But all the time you said that those two guys who weren't listening for 40 years, you could have had an effect on all of us. And that kicks in. I remember there was a distant member of my late wife's family. Oh, I should say today is an American. This is my late wife, her Yorkshire as well. So uh, it's a certainly appropriate. Yeah, and he ends up that's Rifka, my wife, and then Sean, and the Sean should be easy. But there's a member of very the second or third cousin got in touch to say that her son um, was having a problem. Uh, and the only problem, I think, it was with Christianity. So I went to see the young man. I was lecturing at uh, Shabbos at Watson University, and I went down to London, met a lady who a family member that I've never met before, distant family member. Although even she was distant, she looked very similar to the more close family members. Uh, and I met this son. The son was actually sadly a complete mess. I mean, psychologically, was a mess. She hadn't told me because parents generally do not tell you the truth uh, when it comes to will you help my child. I remember once with a grandmother who came to see me uh, in uh, in Manchester to see her son. Uh, sorry, her grandson had been arrested by the police. Uh, by the police for stealing a bag of sugar, or was it flour? One of the two, very strange story uh, from a supermarket. I listened to the story, obviously, something didn't add up, but I actually checked out oh, the police had arrested him for illegal okay, possession and ownership of an AK 47 um, assault rifle. Mm -hmm. A bit different. Yeah, you tend to find that parents uh, don't necessarily, grandparents don't necessarily see the, uh, the, real, uh, the real deal. Anyway, when they, the mother told me her son was having a problem with Christianity, and apparently did, he, he was involved in some Christian cult for a long time. 
Anyway, so we sent women through a, a debate, but it all wasn't well. So it was very difficult to press on hard. But at the end of it, every time I pointed to a wacky Greek con a contradiction in his, in his religion, his religious beliefs, he just kept saying, I can't answer you, but I believe it anyway. I can't answer you, but I believe it anyway. You see, you can't, you can't deploy logic with an illogical mind, or rather with an emotional mind. A logical uh, argument will not be, will be a total irrelevance to somebody who's not logical or is not operating using normal, uh, normal, uh, with the normal parameters of debate. Okay, that's that. That's the introduction. Let's move to the parsha, and then we'll see exactly what the answer has to say about the parsha. And as I say, we're not going to start with, uh, we're not looking at the parsha from the at the beginning of the partial list, whereas if that's the one who's got, got an open mind and gets it right, if you do this and if you do that, as it, as it goes on, as it, at the beginning of the partial, because I'm saying that everything is going to be fantastic, we're going to move to the partial piece of the partial when we're not listening anymore and things are not, well, as a consequence, will not be fantastic. So, if you want to know what that is, that's in chapter 26 um, of the of the uh, of the of this week's partial. And it starts at uh, 14. So our parsha started, if you remember, right at the beginning, if you will keep, if you'll keep my statutes and my laws, etc., then you also have blessings on all the blessings under the sun. And then it's if you don't. So that's where we're starting. So in so 26 and 14, so right from 14 to 15 later, it's from the beginning of the parsha. It says, the in law is And if you've got a closed mind, perhaps, to continue my analogy. Uh, if you get close, it's it being not to but law says, and you don't do a scholar mitz uh, mitzvahs of him, these mitzvahs. But in the society also, and if you um, if you are appalled, most means to me this is horrible. You view my mitzvahs as being horrible. I'm oh, sorry, let me get English translation here. Mm. Uh, and if you will consider my statues revolting, okay. Um, the im es mishpatayti go. And if um, my, it says or, ordinances, all right, mishpotai, as in the society, we also hate my cooking, and mishpotai, my judgments, you will you will uh, consider to be, uh, uh, what do they say? Uh, revolting? Have you been doing revolting before? It seemed very similar to us in Tiago. I'm not entirely sure. What would the English word be for that? Oh, not sure. Right. Uh, to object, you object to them. Um, then, in both cases, the beauty of this is a mitzvah. I will do my mitzvahs. A frechem is crazy, and you will, and you'll break my covenant. Afani es is So I will do the following to you. We're going to come back to that in a second. But basically, in this, in this possibly possibly down in the possibly and possibly it tells you what's going to happen if you don't keep my, my statutes and my laws. But statutes and laws, as we know, because as we've learned many times in our Alsha, there are no such things in Hebrew as synonymous terms, which is why I was struggling so badly to find a good translation of the TV. I think I wrote it here, but I was looking for one. And that's what we can't see it. Okay. Um, yeah, I can't find, I can't think of a good English word. Mias is something that's disgusting to you. Maybe you bridges the word, let's say, let's say Tigo means repulsive, which actually is pretty. It's pretty, it's pretty good translation. So Mias would be repulsive. So let's read that again, because in my struggle, I might have lost you. So again, if you won't listen to me, 26, 14, and if you won't listen to me, and you don't do my mitzvahs. And, and through my hooking, my statutes, that's the laws which have no logical explanation like why women landing together is banned, why the poor are and the ashes of the poor are to purify somebody through contact with a dead body, but make the person doing the purification impure. And because I think also, as Mishpotai and my judgment, is judgment that we do have a logic behind why not killing is a logical thing to do, and not committing adultery is a logical thing rather not to do, etc. And the M is Mishpotai to go, disgust. Oh, I've written here, find the word. I translated it as disgust. To go. Now, Shaka be sold is disgusted. The beauty of us is it's called me, it's my friend, it's pretty safe. Do not do them and you break my covenant. Then God says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do to you, which he goes on to tell. Fine, that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the negative, the person who's not listening, is not listening to what God has to say. 
and there are different words. So I'm not going through the Elsh here, it's very complicated um, fully, but let's, if we can, just look at and consider the different words as we go through it. So let's go through this again. The in law, Sishwali. If you're not listening to me, what does me? The law sasa is called called hamitsas, and you won't do all of the mitzvahs. Later you're going to say mitzvah, it's not my mitzvahs. Uh, it's the mitzvahs, these mitzvahs. The in the kukoi and if you're going to hate my cooking, mitzvahs which you don't uh, have a, a logical explanation for. But as we've brought him to go and you're going to be disgusted by him, we've brought him the mitzvahs you do have a logical explanation from. And the build to us is called the mitzvahs, and the first is basically going to come to break my covenant. Now, Rashi himself uh, says that there are seven uh, conditions, seven statements here of a, 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 uh, a situation of the eventual disconnection, uh, a stage that will produce the eventual disconnection of the Jewish people for, uh, for, uh, from Torah and Mitzvahs. Um, and the Alshik talks about this as well. So I'm going to stick with the Alshik, uh, the Alshik's version of this. Uh, you can look, of course, in Rashi yourself and see it's not too dissimilar. But I think uh, um, for obvious reasons, I, uh, this is an Alshik here. I will uh, just move the Rashi over there. Uh, let's look at the, what the Alshik has to say. So he says, um, good. The way of the Yitzhahara uh, is, he doesn't come and says and say to you, here, um, convert or abandon Judaism altogether or eat pork sandwiches. That's not how the Yitzhahara works. That's not how the process of disconnection, historical disconnection of the Jewish people from their peoplehood, their religion works. It's an, it's an erosion. It's a seduction stage by stage by stage uh, until eventually um, the erosion uh, is complete and the, the cliff face falls so that the, the house built on top of it tumbles into the sea. But it's stage by stage and erosion. So I'll read this to you. So he quotes the Rashi. Um, you'll eventually not do my mitzvahs. This whole process is telling you, the, Hashem is warning you of the process by which the Yitzhah will disconnect you from him. And that's the key. Because it is an erosion, it's a stage by stage progression. The Yitzhah doesn't come say, you know, go and, and become a Buddhist, go and you know, Hindu or anything like that, Christian, it's permissible. Rather, a Tanjan says to you, okay, just well, let's see what it says to you. Um, actually, the key in the cotton yard and start with something very small. The more Lloyd City, Law Yishma, the coil, more in a landing tower to show you won't listen to the Torah and to the people who teach Torah. First thing is to disconnect you to rubbish the rabbis, the teachers, the teachers of our tradition. And I've said to, uh, to you in a previous year, um, if you look back. That there's no greater technique that I could personally think, no greater weapon if I was the Yitzhara that I would like to deploy against the continuity and continuation of the Jewish people than to make them a rubbish, um, given as a, as a verb, to make them rubbish their rabbis uh, and their teachers, to make them see it seem to be a laughing stock, you know, the, the rabbi of like disconnected, uh, you just phrase as a Luftmensch somebody in his head in the clouds disconnected from this world. That's what we said uh, in our little uh, introduction from Rabbi Yitzhak Blazer. We said there is simply no point that somebody's got to that stage when they're not listening to what the rabbis have to say. And that you just have to walk away from that because there's no way of deploying a logical argument that somebody is looking for, if you remember, an emotional response. But let's read on a little bit. So he says, the whole key law yask and lemon come over him the way of the Yitzhara is not to come and say to you, you know, let's worship the Holy God. Uh, starts to look something small. Don't the people who, these old fashioned rabbi guys with big long white beards, don't listen to them. And that's the first step. So the erosion which make people start to stray and wander away from the path that keeps us on the road to Mount Sinai or kept us on the road to Mount Sinai and does it every year as so coming up to Shaduas. Uh, the guides, the people who know the way, 
in there and they don't get talked about. That's the first step. Stem. And incidentally, this is, even though a, I'm reading it from a text from about 500 years ago, but this is, of course, um, a progression you can see historically repeated many times. I'm making this in uh, recording in America. New York's full of such experiences. Um, but anyway, uh, the law says, and then it says, so if we look at our pulse and put this together, the in law so if you won't listen to me, the law says, and the next stage, and then you won't do it. So if you won't listen to the teachers who know how to, to show and explain the Torah to you, next thing, of course, then you won't be program, you won't start doing it. Um, and that's at the Imlos, at Bishmon, and then you have the Elishim, it's not the not, if you don't listen to the teachers, that will lead you to the second stage, the second stage of erosion, who you will assess, you won't do it, but who says, if you're in your dime, we fresh from my submits, it's because of the Elishim. Well, that will lead you to, uh, uh, you think, well, this one is important, it's not important for this, and that one's not important, that's a small mitzvah, and then you stop doing it. And so, the law says, so that's the law says, so it's called mitzvah, so, all these mitzvahs, which mitzvahs? Yedain inam mois behem. It's mitzvah, a specific category of mitzvahs, right? A mitzvah, not call a mitzvah, it's mitzvah, as we pointed out, is what it says at the end of the process. That's the end of the process when you're rejecting all the mitzvahs. But it's saying the beginning of reject is certain category, mitzvah, which ones? And that is, that leads to the third one, the Gedra Misa, which we consider to be the Himiyas, disgusting. No, it's going to be the ones that are chukim. Chukim, that's why it says, if you look at the Gossip again, the Lord says, Sishma, you're not listening to the rabbi. If the Lord says, then he won't do. It's calling it says, at least mitzvahs. Which ones? Chukhoisa. So the ones that you're going to reject immediately are the ones that make no sense, have got no logical, rational explanation. But he gathered me, and you, you really hate them. It won't, you won't, that Yitzhar will not get you to reject the ones that make sense, that no adultery and, and, and no murder, etc. That's way down the line. It's certainly on his agenda, certainly on his radar, but he knows he has to get you to the first, to erode the, your confidence in the, in the integrity of the Torah and God's judgment altogether. Let's start with the little things. that want to make sense to you. Look, that. Doesn't make sense to me. So therefore, that's why I'm going to reject it. Um, and that's that's the first the category of the process says it's hooking. You reject my hooking. And but that I'm be in the chokhois, I think so. So you hate my hooking. And we men will elevate that leads you to the fourth stage. Fourth stage, we hear gold gamma mishpot of shadas mechaim. And the fourth stage is that will get you to be disgusted by the mishpotim, the ones that do make sense, having sufficiently eroded, cut away enough of the cliff face. You're going to cause the whole thing to come down there. And that is even the ones which do make sense, but that's also going to be no longer acceptable to you. Uh, indeed, you can see there's that logic to rejecting bits that don't make sense to you, but not the ones that do. You know, but you'll eventually come to the stage of rejecting those two. That's why I said Tigol. It's a more uh, even forced, disgusted by them, as opposed to Timos, which is just you don't like them. Lama Shagulus, I mean, there's a couple of the cube ball. That stuff that you already had inside you is making sense. It, 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 it did resonate with you, you're rejecting them. But die in Tasa Isa mixes and notion with the model. Now, you might still, because I'm saying, you might still be doing them before you completely the st stage, um, having started to reject, is. To you've not quite rejected the ones that make sense yet, but you're not performing them with real conviction, and you're knowing uh, you're perform, per, performing them as Shalom Allah says, mitzvahs and nashim malamoda. Mitzvahs and nashim malamoda is, of course, mitzvahs which uh, you're doing automatically, just a lifestyle. But there's no sincerity in them. But that in terms of this, mitzvahs and nashim malamoda, but tina me averes mibnei habush mekiyot. You're not doing it there. It's not because you don't think it's a good thing to do. It's not mean you're too embarrassed. People saw you doing it. And there's no sincerity there. It's just a cultural, societal lifestyle, a terrible lifestyle, when you could be sincere. Ach, Mizoyis, Toba, Elam, Shishma, that will lead you to the sixth. That's the sixth. But he has called me so sorry. That is all my mitzvahs are going to reject at that stage. Which leads you to the seventh. The whole of the various mamish, the hackers boy. Um, and then that's the the seventh one is to La Frikim as Brisi. Then you reject your, your connection to God altogether. So those are the seven stages can contain in Apostle 14, 14 and 15. 
Now we get God's reaction. And it's interesting. So what does it say? So here we're going to look at the verse A16. Uh, and it says the following thing. Im af ani asa. Now, im starts off, if you keep the laws, let's say im, you don't, I will do this, but it says af. Now, af means anger. I'm just going to hang into my complete invention that there is some sort of significance to the fact that im is one, aleph is one, and mem is 40. Af, aleph is one, and a is 80, twice as much. Because in order to snap somebody out of what they're 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 involved in, it sometimes needs radical treatment. Uh, it needs a, a proverbial slap across the face in order to get somebody to realize they made a big big mistake. It's not just enough to give them a little rap on the on the on the, on the, on the wrist. Sometimes you need, like, for the worst diseases. Sometimes the treatment, as the phrase goes in English, the, the cure is as bad as the disease. Sometimes you need something radical. What does it say? And then this is what I'm going to do in order to uh, change, change change your back. I'm going to bring on you. Grab quickly the, the art scroll, English translation. I will, it says, a sign over you. Panic. So what does Bahala mean? Panic. And wasting away. And fever. And then it goes on, and you could look at the whole list. How many in the list? Seven. How many in the list of abandonments, of stages of abandonment, of erosion of the Jewish people that leads to this reaction from God? Seven. So there's going to be seven that matches seven. Now let's pause for a second. Dovid and Melech and some of the base of the healing. In, in, for in, uh, chap, in, in Psalm, uh, Psalm 62, and it's uh, verse 13, and it says um, that Melchor Hashem Chesed, to you Hashem is Chesed, or Hashem you act through Chesed, ki ata to Shalom Ishkem because you pay a person back for their deed. Now, listen to what the Hebrew says, ki ata to Shalom, you pay a person back, then I say according to what he did. This is the source of the famous concept, Mida Kenegan Mida. Um, uh, but whatever you do wrong, then Hashem punishes you in the same way, measure for measure. And he said, and Dominic Mello says, that's a chesed. Why is it a chesed? Because unless you're able to see what you did wrong, then how can you know to put it right? So therefore, where, if you do something wrong and you get into troubles, things go wrong in your life, and you're able to make the connection between what's happening to you now and what you did in the past. Then that, that drives you to put right what you did in the past and change your behavior so you don't repeat the past in the future. And as a consequence, then the reason for the punishment is removed and the, the punishment can change as well. So the al now I'm not going to go through all seven, um, but the al says the following thing. I'll do the exact same thing. means it's a meter connected meter, and it's going to be meter connected meter. I'll share along my answer with because you had a closed mind, I can present evidence to open minds, I can present evidence to open minds, because you wouldn't let your mind be open, you wouldn't listen. Then, in that case, I will bring you something called, um, what was our first one? Asher ma'antam nishma v'kal barad shem v'shana, akpadal alechem b'chol, I'll bring to you b'chol. But the English translation here translated that as panic. Um, but funnily enough, one of my tomatoes in seminary asked me yesterday, when we we're discussing the idea, I was quoting the famous Arizals, a uh, great Talmudist for a time to And they say for Shari Kedusha, he points out in the first period twice um, that a bad map character trait is much worse than any individual sin a Vera person can do because the Averas, the things that you do wrong, are the consequence of the root cause of the problem, which is a bad meta, a bad character trait. So work in correcting your character traits and everything else falls into place. So she said, um, but aren't, aren't there other parts of the person's personality that aren't um, necessarily character traits? Because the character trait can change. And she wanted to say, what well, if you suffer from anxiety? Uh, I intuited, of course, that she's probably talking about herself, but anxiety and depression are two uh, conjoined twins, often. And thank God there's good medication these days to, to treat them. But and you shouldn't say medication, by the way. Uh, but anxiety is a terrible thing. So when it says panic, God's going to give you anxiety. Why? Um, because, as he says, the Alshul says, why? 
Because if you're anxious about anything, if somebody comes along and is trying to calm you down, you're not listening. You're panicking. You're you're full of anxiety because you didn't listen. The punishment would be you suffer from anxiety, which means you can't listen. And that allows you to make the connection and deal with what you did wrong in the first place. What comes next? Or what did you do next? If we work back there, well, it's, you can probably guess that. So it says, what in our, our list of the, the, the things that comes next, we, we've got the uh, Hashatefis, wasting away, wasting away. Let's see what the Alshak says about that. Um, I'll stop listening. That's the first one. Oh, in my anger, I will do that. But I'm not the translate. Remember, is being a double ended, a double dose of what you did in order because that's something dramatic to get you to change. But you wouldn't listen now, make you can't listen. At least that wasn't for a while. Okay. And then the second one, but who the law says, and then you didn't act. And because you didn't listen, then you didn't do the missiles. So I'll give you a disease that means that you can't do something. So the English translation here translates is um wasting away. But you be you literally be wasting away. You can't again, you can't do something. You can't act because you're not well. And you can see exactly the path that the, the Alsha is going here, the all, all seven things that God's going to bring to you then you yourself, uh, really, uh, it's because you behaved in the, the same direction, well, in the same way, but in a different direction before, in order to get you to change. So it's a, it's a nida kanega nida idea that God does to you what you've been doing, that allows you to see what you've, you've been doing and to, to put it right. So um, one last idea, and we'll go back to Rabbi Scott Blazer. Um, in his famous Nabarus of Loza, he was really, he brought the writings of Rabbi Shah Salam to life, the founder of the Muslim movement. And he makes a very interesting, a very interesting point. Um, the, the, the Gemara asked the following question, why is it, so Gemara in, in human daf why was it that God, in the desert, God gave the Jews the manna, brought them on every single day? Why didn't he give them it once a year? After all, wheat comes once a year, perhaps twice a year. To to uh, to harvest. Um, why is it that every day they had to go out and collect? The Gemara gives an answer. There was a king who had a son. Remember, uh, all marshals are kings and uh, and princes are uh, princesses as well. To be fair, is gender is gender neutral. Um, and so basically, uh, the boy used to go back every year, see his father, and get his check for the year, his, his stipend, stipend, um, and then he would see him for the other year, for the rest of the year. So the father made him come back and uh, get this um, on a daily basis, fine. That's why it, it, was a, it was actually good for the son to see the father on a daily basis to keep him on the straight and narrow, to keep the connection going. That's a good thing, right? Hmm. But then, it's a blazer who we started with our share with, he says, he goes to Gemara Menachas and Daf Kuf Um And again, he's quoting the Oh, I should have said, of course, when the Torah says all the nasty things, that's called the Tzachikol, the reproof. And there's a second time this, uh, this uh, occurs in the, in the Torah, and that is in Devorim and Pachas de Silvoy. And that's Kofkes and the Feast of the Salaf and Vov. It says the following thing. And Salaf and it says, um, if you don't keep the law, you'll find that your life will be hanging by a thread. You'll be scared both night and day, but well, some of them won't um, believe in your life anymore. The Gemara goes on to say that this is a progression uh, of what's going to happen if the Jewish people don't get it right. You only have enough food for one year, and then you only have enough food for a month, and then eventually it boils down to you only have food for a day. You only have food for a day. And therefore, that's, this isn't the title call. This is the reproof that we find in this week's a Parsha, and when it's repeated, the same concept in Kisabai. So hold on, a minute ago we said that the fact that God gives you the food on a daily basis and gives the Jewish people in the desert, that was a great thing. And here it's saying it's the ultimate curse. But, you mean, imagine you only eat food for one day. That would be a terrible thing. It depends on you. It depends on you. If, as Rabbi Sobloza said, you're the sort of Jew who learned the Sharma Tochel of the Chobos 
um, that's just me hinting you should get my my translation and commentary on the subject uh, on this paper. But if you if you really in, really made that part of your heart, then the fact you've only food for one day is okay. I believe in God. So we say at the end of, of benching that the Seyach HaSidecha must be a high quality of its son. Jen opened his heart and he opens his hands and feeds everybody. He can make food today. He can make food tomorrow. That's if you believe in God. But if, and, and, and you've listened to what God has to say, I'll look after you. That was the story of, of being in the desert and getting them on a daily basis. You got the message. But if you don't believe in God, when the fact you don't have food for a day or even for a month, you've only got a month left, a month savings left, that will be a challenge. That will be a big challenge. But it's the exact same circumstance. It depends how you look at it. It depends. I can present evidence to other minds. I can't present evidence to other minds. If somebody wants to listen, you've got the answers. If somebody doesn't want to listen, then every logical answer you can give them is going to be something that they can feel fear. But why don't we feel it? Because they didn't listen in the first place. They disconnected from not listening. You're not going to do from uh, listening is from the words of the Chachomim, the rabbis. And then you're going to do the mitzvahs. Which mitzvahs? The ones that have no logical rationale to you. But that'll lead on to you doing, uh, not doing the ones that have got a logical rationale. In fact, you come to hate them. You come to reject them as well. But the, the full list we just went through with the al it's me that there's an ultimate me to negative me here. There's an irony. It's almost like a very bad joke. The exact same circumstances that for somebody who hasn't disconnected is no problem whatsoever. In fact, brings them closer to God. To somebody who's disconnected from God, those circumstances make their life an absolute hell. I can present evidence to open minds. I cannot present evidence to open minds. It depends whether if the person is listening, listening or not. And that if word that starts at the beginning of the Pasha is even those with two letters is a very big one indeed. We've got to make sure we're listening so we don't get to the aft word where God has to give us a double dose of medicine in order to get back on track. I should look forward to seeing you next week. Good job.